All right, I think we'll crack on. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this discussion on how to harness the quiet power of active listening. I'd like to open this session by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands from which we're gathering today and by paying my respects to their elders past and present. And I extend that respect to any First Nations people joining us today. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Jordana. I'm the Client Success Lead for Australia and New Zealand for Unmind. Some of you may be familiar with Unmind already or have access to our app and our content through your employer. For those of you who don't know us, um, we are an employee mental health platform. Uh, we were founded in the UK in 2016 and opened up operations here in Australia and in the US in just over two years ago now. We work to empower individuals to proactively measure and manage their mental well-being and to impact cultural change through all organizational layers as well. And we do this by being a strategic well-being partner, by upskilling managers and leaders, by providing measurement and mapping data to key workplace factors to package up recommendations for organizations. As an organization working in the mental health space, we really wanted to recognize Are You Okay Day um, at Australian Mental Health Awareness Day uh, coming up on the 8th of September, as well as World Suicide Prevention Day coming up on the 10th of September. By calling on two fantastic guest speakers that we have here today to talk about deep and active listening. Listening being a skill that we exercise every single day, but often do so on autopilot. When having conversations with family members, friends or colleagues, we know that um, it's a skill that can take on new meaning. So I'm really delighted to welcome Oscar Trimboli and Dr. Aileen Allegado to expand on this really important topic. So I'll do a quick introduction before handing over to them. Um, Oscar Trimboli is an author, keynote speaker and host of the Apple award-winning podcast, Deep Listening. Oscar is a veteran of the marketing and technology industry, consulting with a vast portfolio of organizations such as Google, PwC and Salesforce. Through his work with chairs, with boards of directors, with exec teams, Oscar has experienced firsthand the transformational uh, impact that leaders and organizations can have when they listen beyond the words. And he's really passionate about using the gift of listening to bring positive changes to homes, to workplaces and cultures worldwide. Dr. Aileen Allegado is the Director and Primary Clinician of Mindset Consulting in Sydney, Australia. She's a registered clinical psychologist, um, specializing in the treatment of mental uh, health conditions, the administration of neuropsychological assessments, and the use of psychometric tools. The diversity of Aileen's career involves the provision of clinical work in both private and corporate settings, in training other clinicians, as well as being a public advocate for mental health awareness, often speaking on the subject in the media and in well-known news publications and lifestyle magazines, such as The Morning Show, The Sydney Morning Herald, and uh, Harper's Bazaar. So today, Oscar and Aileen will be discussing and sharing some really important and practical information around what is the desired outcome of having a challenging conversation, checking in with someone, how you can prepare yourself for that conversation, the five levels of deep listening, listening filters and bias, practical examples and responsibility and accountability. When you signed up for this webinar, we asked if there were any particular questions that you wanted answered. So thank you so much to everybody who has shared questions. Oscar and Aileen have reviewed these and will be weaving as many answers as possible into their discussion today. There'll also be some additional resources highlighted in the chat by the Unmind team, and um, these will be shared in the follow-up email as well, uh, as well as the recording of today's session. So lastly, before I hand over some very brief housekeeping items, please use the chat function to share any comments or thoughts, and you can also use the Q&A function to share um, any further questions for our speakers. We would really love for this to be as interactive a session as possible. We know this topic is very critical, it's near and dear to many of our hearts, uh, has the potential to save lives, and there are many important questions to be asked, so please do so. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Aileen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jordana, and welcome to everyone joining us today on this um, very exciting hour of us talking about are You OK Day? Well, in lieu of the Are You OK Day, which is a national push for mental health awareness, but also in light of having the difficult conversations that are going to be positive for workplaces, for your homes, for your relationships and the community. 
So I'd like to kick off with a poll because I feel that this is something that might be relevant for people when somebody asks, why do we have to ask these questions? Why is it relevant? So if I can just get Jordana to um, send a poll to everyone, which is going to just a yes or no answer. Have you ever come across with someone with mental illness? And we'll give you about 90 seconds to answer that. Okay, so the polls have come in and 96%, a whopping 96% of you have come across with someone with mental illness and 4% haven't. So we can safely say that this is more of a common theme and something that will be, um, you'll be coming across at some point if you haven't already. And so that brings me to the topic of why is this important and relevant more than ever? And just to bring up a slide. Um, can everyone see that? Looks great. And uh, Aileen, I just wanted to acknowledge Shannon in the chat. She'd lost someone two weeks ago in, in the context of this conversation. So my condolences to you, Shannon. Um, I, okay, so this is just a brief slide as to why we are actually talking about this and why this is important. So these are Australian statistics that are gathered by the Are You OK team. Over half of Australians wish that, that someone had asked them if they were OK. So it's actually quite a staggering um, statistic. And that young Australians between the ages of 18 to 29 years old are more likely than any other age groups. And they agree strongly, 32% of them, that when they are struggle, they try and hide it. So it goes unnoticed if no one asks. And approximately two thirds of people, so that 63% of us are not confident that we know the signs that someone might be struggling with life. So that is actually what's getting in the way. And then 41% hadn't asked someone if they're okay because they weren't sure they knew the signs or how to. So these are really important skills. These are really important ways at which today we will hopefully help solve some of these issues. But there is hope because nearly one in 2% of us, so nearly 50% of everyone um, who participated in this survey believe that they will be more confident in starting a conversation if they knew the signs. So that will be what will be kicking off is how to start the conversation of what do you look out for when someone is struggling or when to ask, are you okay? So most people will say to me, Aileen, but I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm not trained in mental health. And I don't really know what to say or what to look for. And I'd like to just point out that there is no qualifications that is needed to be able to be present and listen and show care. And that is much more powerful than any words that you're going to say and a lot of the a lot of the statistics show that being asked a question is actually something whether the person is ready to hear it or not is something that opens up a conversation that is going to be positive for them in seeking help down the track so here are just some basic signs to look out for just so we know that are we on the right track when we are asking people and we're worried about them these are just 
examples. It's not exhaustive. There's a lot more. And please feel free on the chat box to add any of your personal experiences. But we want to look out for a situation. What is going on with this person in their life? So often things that are trigger points or flashpoints for stress are including relationship breakdown, transitional changes in life, such as moving house, getting married, having children, financial stress and work stress. And a lot of things that I guess like daily life that we take for granted that kind of start to build up and in someone can create pressure and create struggle. The other thing to watch out for is listening out for language and what people are saying. Often when someone is struggling, their types of thinking starts to become more negative or pessimistic, especially their view about the future. They can also become quite critical of themselves and others, and they use self-deprecating language that is, I'm a loser, or what's the point, I, I'm a burden to others. So that those are the common things that really give us a little bit of a hint that someone isn't really doing well. And finally, uh, these are just some of the behaviours that we would want to look out for to see if someone is struggling or to identify someone struggling is that we notice a change in their behaviors that is uncharacteristic of them. So what that might mean is like if someone's normally quite upbeat and chatty and they become withdrawn, then that's a change in the behavior. Alternatively, if someone is actually um, generally quite calm and quiet and you see them pretty agitated and keyed up, again, that would be a cause for concern. Withdrawal or isolation is some of the search, some of the common behaviors that we observe, poor hygiene or being disheveled because of all other problems such as um, poor sleep. There might be increased use of alcohol or other substances, poor memory, lack of concentration, loss of interest in activities and reckless behavior. So I'm sure that there's actually a lot more in this um, list that we can add and I invite you to do so because I guess this is all of the things that we want to be looking out for when we are getting ready to have that conversation. So moving on to yes we have actually some of these things in front of us and we are concerned then the first step is to check in with yourself. It's like the analogy of the safety videos in on the plane. We want to make sure that your oxygen mask on is, is first on before helping others, that we are okay ourselves before we have that conversation about somebody else's mental health. So making sure that you are the right person to be asking these questions. Again, you don't need to be a professional to listen. You don't need to be a professional to ask because there's no pressure in needing to fix, but just checking whether you also have the capacity and energy to have that conversation in a respectful and meaningful way. And with that, I'd like to then pass on to Oscar, who will be talking more about the actual listening when someone does engage in that conversation. But before we do that, I wanted to um, just throw to Oscar a question that we have here, which is, what do I do when I am uncomfortable with awkward silences? Silence is okay. There's no coincidence that listen and silent share the identical letters. In Western cultures, silence is referred to as awkward, deafening, confronting. In the East, in high context cultures though, <laughs> silence is a sign of wisdom, respect and authority. And I think for many of us, we've grown up in environments where we think that listening is the presence of questions, asking lots of questions. But sometimes, Aileen, just your presence and your silence will change the way that the speaker thinks about the way they communicate. 
And I'm sure in your own practice, uh, this is part of your professional training. Today, I'll talk about listening in a workplace context. I won't talk about it in a therapeutic context, which you're an expert on. So I'm curious, what's your relationship with silence when you're sitting down working with clients? Well, I did the um, listening quiz that you uh, sent out. I don't know how many of the others did them, but I found out, and it's not a surprise to me, that uh, I tend to problem solve while I am listening. And I feel like there's elements of that that comes through from my job, but also that I am in context, I am also one of five children in my family. And that means, you know, like growing up, you needed to be seen and heard. And if you actually don't get in when there's a silent moment, you will probably miss out. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I, I was I was the firstborn in my family, but for my entire teenage years, or at least most of it, five years, I I basically had a werewolf jaw, Aileen, which meant I had braces for five years, not one or two, and I became really skillful at asking questions and deflecting attention so people wouldn't look at me. So our listening behavior is taught to us from a relatively early stage in life. And if we're not conscious of it, without any training whatsoever, we won't understand how to improve our listening. We know that in the workplace, only 2% of people have had any training in how to listen. And today, hopefully, we'll give you a few tips to understand what are the barriers that get in your way when it comes to listening. And one, one of the things we wanted to do was ask these questions in advance because listening happens before, during and after the conversation. A lot of people think listening just happens in the moment. And that's one of the reasons we ask you questions in advance. Now, when it comes to the context of this conversation that you're going to have with somebody, are you okay? Um, sometimes that's not the first question you should be asking. Uh, you, you might want to do something that maybe sets the scene like, hey, what would make this a good conversation for you today? What would you like out of the conversation today? And then move into that because they're really hard. Are you okay? Um, it it may, may not be appropriate given the relationship you have. And there's amazing resources on the Are You Okay website to think about how to ask these questions as well. Now, when it comes to our listening, uh, a couple of years ago, I interviewed Jennifer and Christopher. They told me a story. Jennifer was a primary school teacher who was a stay-at-home mum for, for a period of time. And Christopher, her son at the age of three, came home from school. And Jennifer asked her son, Christopher, hey, what did you learn at school today? And he said, mommy, mommy, uh, I learned maths. I learned the three is half of eight. Now, Jennifer had other kids in the, in the area and thought she misheard her son and said, honey, could you say that again? And he said, I learnt maths and I learnt the three is half of eight. And Jennifer, she just put her hands in her face and thought, what the heck are they teaching kids at school today? So she went to the cupboard and she got eight M&Ms out of the cupboard and lined up these little chocolate soldiers on the kitchen table. And she lined up the soldiers two by two, all facing each other and picked Christopher up and put him on the table and said, Christopher, honey, can you count the chocolate soldiers in this line here? And he went, one, two, three, four, mummy, there's four on this side. And how many on the other side, Christopher? And he said, mummy, it's exactly the same, it's four. And Jennifer then went and explained to her son, Christopher, four is half of eight, not three. And with that, Christopher leapt off the table, went and grabbed a piece of paper. And what he did was he drew the figure eight for his mum. And then he folded it in half. And then he folded it in half again. And then he tore it in half. And he said, see, mummy, three is half of eight. And in that moment, Jennifer realized that Christopher processed the world very differently. Now, in this moment, 
you're thinking three is half of eight, four is half of eight, and zero is half of eight as well. But if you're educated in a Western education system, you're taught to pattern match and listen for similarities rather than differences. There will be a percentage of the audience who was absolutely screaming at me going, what are you talking about, Oscar? Three is not half of eight. Why would you even have a story about three is half of eight? And there'll be a percentage of the audience who made the visual connection. And this is the difference between listening to what people say versus listening to what they think and what they mean. So JC is going to run a poll for us now. And the poll is a very simple question. When it comes to listening, do you think you listen for similarities? Or do you think you listen for differences? Pop your vote in the panel and we'll see where you come out. Is your primary listening orientation to pattern match based on evidence, education, to do it based on your cultural background, to do it based on your life experience? For many of us, we don't realize that this very simple listening filter gets in our way. Now, I wanna point out that whether you listen for similarity or whether you listen for difference, whether you listen for contrast or the familiar, neither is correct or incorrect. It's being conscious about which one's appropriate in that moment. So for many of us, we don't realize that we have one of these as our listening filter. So I'm just gonna pause, have a quick look here at the, at the results as they come in and it's no surprise, it often is 75 to 83% people are listening to similarities. Now, it was a bit naughty because I gave you a false binary choice, but there is often a group of people, a subset who would say both. This group is typically only 5% of a population where they're conscious enough to go, in this moment, is it appropriate for me to listen for similarities? Is it appropriate for me to listen for differences? Again, I just want to point out neither is right or wrong. It's what's appropriate in the moment. And so if we can't connect to how that other person is expressing themselves, we can't connect to somebody who's low energy. We can't connect to somebody whose behavior has dramatically changed from what it is previously. We can't connect to somebody who in the past has really cared about hobbies and have been active in their community, but suddenly they're withdrawn. Somebody in the workplace who's regularly offering answers, regularly contributing, but possibly this week, this month, something's changed. And it's not just changed in the words they use, it's the energy and the state that they bring to the conversation as well. So I wanna give you three numbers. We've already learned that zero is half of eight, three is half of eight, and four is half of eight. The three numbers I want to give you will help you understand the importance of silence in a conversation, the importance of the pause, the importance of being a non-qualified therapeutic professional to be able to ask that question that, are you okay? For many of us, we avoid asking that question because we're worried what their response might be. And we're going to talk about that shortly with Aileen and how do you have that conversation in a very effective way? So the three numbers are 125, 400 and 900. 125 words per minute is my speaking speed. You can get up to 150. And if you think about a horse race caller, they're talking about 200 words per minute. Now we know we can listen to audio books and podcasts and even compulsory compliance training in your workplace at two times speed, and we can still understand it there as well. Now, when it comes to your listening, you're listening at 400 words per minute. You are programmed to be distracted. You have peripheral vision. You also have peripheral hearing. So a lot of questions that we got, Aileen, were questions like, Oscar, there are so many distractions at any given time. What tips would you give me to deal with those distractions? So the 
corollary to put your own oxygen mask on first is deal with your own distractions first so you can be present to listen in the conversation. So number one, manage your electronic notifications, whether that's a connected watch, whether that's a mobile phone, whether that's a cell phone, whether that's a handy, wherever you're tuning in from, just manage the technology. Don't let the technology manage you. Be in control of those notifications rather than you randomly reacting to them. Tip number two, drink a glass of water. You should be drinking a glass of water before you go into a conversation and every 30 minutes in a conversation as well. So I'd encourage you all to pause right now because we're about the 30 minute mark is my guess. Have a glass of water and I'm gonna have a look at the chat and we'll come back with tip number three. We've got a, we've got a good question here that says, Oscar, can you give me an example of listening for differences? We'll come to that really quickly. When it comes to listening for differences, the easiest way to think about it is think about the opposite, which is groupthink. Everybody thinks the same way. And a way to listen for differences is thinking about asking questions about the very distant future or the very distant past get the person to become external to themselves. Get them to describe that as a color. My favorite question is, if you were a drink, what drink would you be right now? Would you be Fanta? Would you be Coke? Would you be a glass of white wine? And sometimes I get an answer like flat mineral water, Oscar. That's how I'm feeling right now. Great. So your job is not to judge what color, what drink, what movie, what they want to do in the distant future or the past. Your job is to merely be present to listen for what they're saying. So tip number one, manage the electronic notifications. Tip number two, drink a glass of water. And the act of drinking a glass of water in someone's presence will role model to them that they should drink a glass of water as well. Now the doc will tell me that there's a very clear signal that sends to the parasympathetic nervous system that says everything's okay when you take in a drink of water. And tip number three is three deep breaths. Three deep breaths before you go into a conversation, in through your nose, all the way down to the bottom of your lungs and then out there as well. So these three tips will get you present to distraction. This shows up because there's a four times difference in how I can speak and how you can listen. In fact, it's happening for you right now because you've got other things in your life that are going on right now. You may be thinking, I wish I would have had breakfast. I hope this guy can talk faster. I wonder what I'm going to have for lunch. Is he going to answer my question in the chat? Now, the last number is 900. 900 is really important. This is the average thinking speed in a workplace of a workplace professional. I'm thinking at 900 words per minute, but if you work in a workplace that uses a lot of collaboration, it's a competitive environment, maybe there's conflict, maybe there's resource constraints, you could be thinking at up to 1600 words per minute. Why does that matter? If I'm thinking at 900 words per minute and I can speak at 125, it means the very first thing I say is 14% of what I'm thinking. That's why it's critical to allow silence to do the heavy lifting for you. When you move your orientation from a listener who's trying to understand what the other person is thinking to a deep listener, a person who is trying to help the speaker make sense of what they're thinking, it doesn't matter so much that you're trying to understand everything they say. Your role is to help them understand what they're thinking and ultimately what they're meaning. Three simple phrases will always uncover that extra 125 words. These three phrases will change the body posture of that person. I'll either take in a deep breath and sigh. Their spine will change position. Their head tilt will change position. 
yesterday I was doing some work in Delhi and I was working with a workplace professional has a quite a complex organization and 20 minutes into the conversation he just twisted his head into the conversation in a completely different way and I said God of what's just happened and it took a while for his mind to catch up and he said I didn't realize the impact of, in this case, I was listening for similarities and the impact that had on his organization. But if your head's buried in a phone or a laptop and you're not completely present to the other person, you wouldn't have even noticed the head tilt that Gaurav had in that moment. So here are those three questions. And when you ask these questions, you will move and change the speaker's perspective. They will change the way they communicate and they will change the way they think about what they are about to say. Three questions are, tell me more. Really easy to say, isn't it? Very difficult to practice, by the way. Because a lot of our primary listening barriers, as Aileen mentioned earlier on, is the urge to fix the problem. Now, if you take the listening quiz at listeningquiz.com, you can discover your primary listening barrier and there are four of them. The first one is that you want to connect with them emotionally, but you do it in a sympathetic way rather than an empathetic way. It's not your job to feel their emotion, it's your job to acknowledge their emotion. So when you visit the listening quiz, you can take the seven minute quiz and you'll get a really quick response to what is your listening barrier and that first one the dramatic listening villain wants to connect emotionally but moves the spotlight off the speaker onto yourself the second listening villain is the interrupting listening villain they're very time orientated they want to do things quickly but unfortunately they will create more friction in the relationship and reduce friction by jumping in early anticipating and answering incorrectly. They're like a quiz show contestant that presses the buzzer before the host has asked the complete question, they answer the wrong question. The next listening barrier is your attention. We call it the lost listening villain. They're either lost in their role in the conversation or they're lost in an external distraction like an electronic device, or it could be just the content of the dialogue. If you show up as a lost listening villain, the, the recommendation is really simple. Ask them what role you would like to play in this conversation. And that's as simple as saying, hey, what would make this a great conversation? Or what would make this a great conversation for you? And then finally, the shrewd listening villain, as Aileen mentioned earlier on, is the problem solving machine. They're jumping ahead two, three, four, five, six problems ahead. And when they get there, they actually haven't understood what the other person's trying to communicate. If you're a shrewd listening villain, the problem solving machine, focus more on how they say it rather than what they say. Because again, shrewd is pattern matching into the future as well. So these are all the barriers. Now remember those questions. Question number one was tell me more. Question number two is, and what else? Or you could abbreviate that and simply say and, um, but you'd have a Good relationship with that person to say that. And remember, these questions are all designed to get the next 125 words out so they can express what they mean rather than what they say the first time. Now, the final one is the most powerful one. And it's where we started this conversation with Aileen. The third question to pose to somebody that will really act like a magnet and draw it out is the most powerful, but use it carefully. By the way, if your question is longer than eight words, it's probably not a question. It's probably some kind of biased interpretation or a statement. So the shorter your questions, the more impactful they will be when it comes to your listening. Here's the third question, the third phrase that you use. Now, for some of us, we might say it's really difficult to pause and be silent. 
But when you do, it acts like a magnet and draws out what that person really wants to say, what they mean, what comes not just from their head, but also from their heart, from their complete being there as well. So those three questions, tell me more and what else? And then finally, just be silent. So there's no coincidence that the word silent and listen share the same letters. Aileen, any questions you've noticed coming up in the chat? Because I've got, I've got a question for you. Okay, go ahead, Oscar. My question is, so what do I do when they say I'm not okay? I guess that's like an answer to be inviting them to talk and tell me more. Right. So remember, in the beginning, we said, ask the question with an intention of genuinely being present and being able to give them the time and the space so that when they do say, I'm not OK, we don't panic. Often what puts people off from asking the question is that they don't really know what to do and feel like they have to fix the problem. But as we know that being there and being there for someone asking someone the question is actually already an intervention in itself so that's okay it's okay if they're not okay asking them is there something that i can help with you know tell me more would you want to share a little bit more about what's going on with you so that invites us to have a deeper more meaningful conversation with this person which I see also is a gift when someone shares their vulnerability with us. And that's where the listening is important that we actually really appreciate what the other person is doing as they are exposing or showing their vulnerability to us. Well, the, on the Are You OK website, there's four steps. The first one's get ready, the next one's listen, Take us through the last two steps as uh, we help everyone out with their questions. I'm going to pop over to the chat while you're doing that and see if there's any questions from the group. Cool. So now we've listened and we know what our listening villains are and we know what sort of things get in the way from us being effective listeners. And what I like what Oscar was saying about being an active listener and not just listening for the words, but actually being able to observe and watch little nuances or changes in their behavior, which obviously makes us also mindful that we're paying attention to this person and not thinking about other things at the same time. So the next step is encourage, encourage action. So that is our invitation for them to be able to tell us what they need or how they would like to proceed in getting help if they want help. Not everybody's going to necessarily want anything like, uh, you know, we can be a sounding board or a conduit to a solution eventually. And so being comfortable that the person might not know exactly what they need and allowing perhaps the silence or your question to sit with them and reflect and hopefully come back when they do know what they need. So this is also our cue to not bear the burden of this, but continue with suggestive questions such as, have you experienced this before? What have you done in the past that's worked? And if you were feeling quite um, open to sharing your feeling to your feelings and experiences, you might even say, you know, when I was going through that, I found this going going to the gym actually really helps. So trying to relate some of your difficulties to connect with the person. And again, not solving the problem, but just allowing them to have the space to, to do that and encourage action, regardless of whether there was action or steps taken. And then leaving some time between that and reminding ourselves that 
you know, when somebody asks you and they tell you something, it will be nice if there was a check-in afterwards. So whether that might be the following week or when you next see them around the office, just checking in and saying, you know, how did you go with that X? And following up or sending them a message, just letting them know that you're there to listen if they want to talk about things. Again, the pressure shouldn't be about you being the only person to do it, but it's more of the encouragement that as individuals, that, that, that care and attention that we give others is something that is in itself a really good act of kindness that people feel comfortable that let their guard down. And that's the thing about having your guard up or down is that people need to feel quite comfortable before they share these things. So it's also okay if they don't appear to be okay and you ask the question and they say, I'm fine, right? So asking the question doesn't really have to be confrontational. And some tips around this when you do ask and then you get the response of I'm fine and you think that there might be more going on. Don't be confrontational, but more so just stick to facts and perhaps just say what you have noticed. Say, okay, well, I just wanted to check in because I've noticed that you've been late for work every day this week and it's just so unlike you. Right, and, and that's okay if they actually don't want to talk about it, but that you have asked and you've checked in. So these are the things that we have to be comfortable around for us to be able to have these conversations and that these conversations are not scary and they're actually things that every single one of us as human beings experience. And so I feel that the more that we are open to asking people, the more open we are in sharing when we are also struggling. Yeah. Hey Doc, uh, we got a really good question here in the chat. And the chat question is from Lisa and uh, I hope I've pronounced that correctly. And she says, are there any tips if someone's highly emotional, crying, or agitated at a time? Any tips on that? From my perspective, there's a beautiful book that I would recommend, Lisa. It's called uh, Permission to Feel by Professor Mark Brackett, who talks about listening to and for emotion in a workplace. I think a lot of us get defensive when people express emotion. Emotion is present in every human conversation, whether that's crying, whether that's any kind of emotion. I think it takes a good deal of consciousness to go, what they're about to tell us really matters to them. So Aileen, I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, when you get that, how do you deal with that? And by the way, thanks to the question, um, that was from Ben. He said, uh, are you okay, Yoda? Uh, okay, are you Yoda? Uh, so Ben, um, depends which Yoda you're talking to. People keep sending me Yodas and I've never actually watched Star Wars more than once because I thought I had to learn all about that. So sorry if I feel like a villain saying that out aloud. So Aileen, how do you respond when people express demonstrative emotion in a dialogue? I think it's actually checking in on ourselves about what we how we feel about these negative emotions often people might have feelings about negative emotions like sadness or anger and would have a judgment that they're bad and so they can't also be around it so reframing it in our minds and just seeing the emotion as a data point that this person is showing the emotion for a reason and there, there is a reason for that and so getting past the actual emotion itself and being in a position of openness and curiosity where it actually all of that stuff melts away and we get to have that connection 
rather than that wall or defensiveness because we feel like the person is unstable or might hurt us. But when we get to that level of care, we find that actually they're like everybody else. You know, the person that actually is yelling and screaming and angry is just as upset as someone who is also crying in tears in the corner. They're just different expressions of being upset about something and having their needs communicated and met. And Aileen, I would also say, Congratulations if people express that emotion to you because it's a sign of trust in the relationship that they're willing to share that with you. So acknowledge that you do have a great relationship. Most people won't feel comfortable expressing emotions in the complete range to people that they don't trust, they don't feel psychologically safe with. By the way, Aileen, there's a big ninja move in the chat box. Break out the chocolate when people cry. Where do you stand on that? I'm big on the Hague's chocolate. The frogs often sent out to my clients when I'm doing a video conference with them. Uh, where do you stand on the chocolate? And then Luke has made a powerful point that everybody's responding to. Luke feels that Are You OK Day in his company is tokenistic and nobody takes the effort to learn what we're presenting today. So first question, Aileen, where do you stand on the chocolate? I'm, I'm all for the chocolate. Awesome, and do you have a favorite? No, just uh, maybe Toblerone. Hey, all right. Yeah, all good right. hazelnut. Excellent, and uh, Luke, Luke's got a lot of people kind of plus one on him where they say, um, Luke says it's tokenistic, they hand out some muffins, they slap people on the back, they put up a logo and that's it for the year. Uh, how do you think we can move organisations from this being something that's conscious once a year to something that's just human to human conversations? And any tips from that point of view to make Are You OK just a conversation that you have all the time, not just this week? not just this month, but it's something that people and organisations are more comfortable with. Absolutely. And I think it's about the modelling, right, Oscar? Like being ourselves comfortable with asking the questions, putting the time aside to listen. And it's like Valentine's Day, you know? It's like the day that everybody buys roses, goes out for their date nights. But actually, they say, you know, in your relationship, it probably it means a lot more if you've actually done those things outside of that one day. And same goes for days like today, right? They are actually just a reminder. The day is a reminder that this is something that as a community would like to be accountable for those around us and for the people that we care about and for other people to also have our backs and care about us when we're not doing well. So I feel that this is actually also important in terms of just communities and building relationships with your teams and talking about a checking in process or a system that works for the company or works for the team would be a really good idea and a good start. Awesome. Uh, one of the questions in the panel is dealing with neurodiversity when it comes to these situations. So I'm going to tell you a story about Christopher and Jennifer, where three is half of eight. You see, what you don't know about Christopher is he's a world champion bug catcher, but he's also considered neurodivergent. And the way he processes the world is completely different. And when I interviewed Christopher and his mom uh, about how to dialogue with somebody in this context, I'm reminded of a work I was brought in to do with a board of a very complex financial services organization. And there was one board member that consistently didn't make eye contact with the rest of the board. And they were considered not a team player. They were considered somebody who didn't have the appropriate social skills. They were brilliant at their role and they were fantastic at what they do. In both cases, Myself and Christopher would say the same thing. Communicate about how you communicate. 
So an example of this is I do work with actuaries. <laughs> so actuaries, very complex mathematical stuff. I, I failed high school maths. So when I'm in that environment, the second thing I say after what would make this a great discussion is, by the way, I had this calculus, which means I don't have a great relationship with numbers. Sometimes I might ask very basic questions when it comes to the maths you're dealing with. They all smile and they go, no problem, Oscar, we got you back. Now back to this director. We sat down, just her and I, and we had a conversation and very quickly that pattern of behavior came about. And what I realized very quickly was she was a visual listener. And what she wanted to do was remove visual distractions so she could concentrate desperately on the conversation, which meant she was literally looking down at her shoes. What I asked her to do from that point on was describe to the team that when her eye contact goes away, it is a technique she's using to concentrate. Concentrate deeply on what's being said, but what she was doing in that moment is communicate about how she communicates. From that point on, the board and her interactions with the board changed completely. Now she was on the neurodiverse spectrum. Christopher was a camp counselor and he finished college much earlier than most people. So he was often the youngest kid at university and he always would communicate about how he communicates neurodivergently. So he talked about how he touches people. He talks about how his attention span requires shorter sentences, more to the point and more direct conversations. So part of the responsibility lies with you to communicate what will be appropriate for you. And the opposite is true too. If you ask what would make this a great conversation, sometimes that's the opportunity there as well. Any add-ons there? Aileen, when it comes to communicating across neurodivergent people? I, I have this really good quote by um, an author or a psychologist, and they said, the problem with communication is that we think that there is communication going on. So I think that nicely sums up what you've, you've spoken about. And um, I just wanted to answer a question that's come up on the chat from Joe, and it seemed like other people are also interested in our answer to it. Oscar, what are your thoughts on social media oversharing when I see it regularly from those seeking attention and I can become desensitized? Really great question. All right. Well, being an expert on listening, I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert in social media oversharing. Um, it's another form of content is how I would look at this. So when it comes to listening, there's five levels of listening, listening to yourself, listening to content, listening to context, listening to unsaid and listening for meaning. Uh, social media to me, it would just be another form of content. And I suspect by the way that question's being posed, there are some underlying assumptions where they're listening for similarities rather than difference. I think there's a heuristic or a, a mental assumption there that oversharing is good or bad, I'm not sure. Use the technology, don't let the technology use you as something I said earlier on. If you suspect that there is a change in a pattern from somebody on social media, use a completely different communication modality to contact them. Pick up the phone, go and walk around to their desk, knock on their door, have a conversation. Social media is far too low context, a communication modality for the kinds of conversations we are talking about here. Don't jump to any conclusions for what is happening on social media. And if you suspect there's a change in behavior, change the communication modality, pick up the phone, go and visit them go and have a human conversation would be my tip. And my tip for that is to go back to what we said before in terms of, are you the right person to be asking this person, are you okay? Because you may not, right? If this was actually like a, a post that we don't know whether the person is actually reaching out for help or actually using social media as a sounding board. 
And whatever it is, you know, we can't control what other people's intentions or behaviors are, but we can set boundaries to what is healthy for us. So looking after yourself when it comes to being involved and helping others really should start with a question about what am I open to, prepared to do? What are my boundaries? What is the extent that I could help this person and support this person? So that's always it, something to keep in mind because I suppose that is what gets in the way of people asking the question because they probably don't really kind of want to be involved when they do have the answer. But as we've talked about today, there's different ways that that conversation can happen and that these conversations must happen because it does save lives and it does actually help a lot for those people that need it. Well, while JC's uh, firing up another poll in the background, listening to us is interesting. Listening to each other is even more powerful. May I request in the chat, just let the rest of the people present here know, what are you doing in your workplace to make Are You OK visible? What are you doing in your workplace to make Are You OK visible? Whether that's at an individual, a team or organisation level, please share what you're doing so we can all learn from each other and please share it, not just in the chat back to the host, but to everybody. This is a really powerful way we can listen to each other, steal ideas and pirate from each other. And the power of this group is exponential. The power of the presenters is linear and we would love you all to learn from each other. What are you doing to bring Are You OK visibility even more? With that, JC, at uh, exactly to time, it's back over to you. So we've got one poll up there. A last poll to check in. If you're feeling more confident about asking the question, are you okay after today's session? Thank you so much, both of you. That was that was incredible. Um, and I really appreciate your fantastic insights. I'll just leave the poll going for a moment. Um, I can see that they're overwhelmingly in favor of yes, which is fantastic. And I think I speak for most people on this webinar um, that we're here because we genuinely care about this topic and, and really do want to help, but maybe we do have a bit of that fear factor around not knowing how to proceed or around making things worse. And I feel like your practical tips have really certainly helped me to break down and make this more achievable. So thank you very much. Um, we will be sending a, a follow up containing the recording of the session and the resources that have been mentioned today as well, as well as Oscar and Aileen's details, so sh should you wish to learn more about the work that they're doing um, or to contact them directly. A quick note before we wrap also that uh, over the coming week, Unmind is running a series for lessons in listening quick practical lessons to help you hone the quiet power of active listening for everyday chats and the moments that matter. For example, helping you to switch off the reply instinct and instead tune in with more active listening or how to ask better, more encouraging questions to help people to open up. Um, if you'd like to view those, please visit Unmind's LinkedIn page or other social channels. But otherwise, for the moment, um, thank you so much for joining us and for your participation, your questions, your sharing. And once again, to Oscar and to Aileen for sharing your expertise with us. It was a fantastic session. Thank you.